Reid Hoffman is my friend and one of the key thought leaders in Silicon Valley, a member of the so-called PayPal Mafia and a founder of LinkedIn. Reid is the leading proponent of bridge scaling, achieving rapid, non-linear growth to lead the market. According to Reid, the goal is not to scale for its own sake, but rather to scale to meet the unmet needs of humanity. He believes that scaling, not just starting up, this is the real secret behind Silicon Valley's success. This week, join us for the throwback edition of the next wave from our 2015 Samsung CEO Summit. But first of all, really thanks for coming today. Pleasure. Um, you built some big company. <laughs> <laughs> big companies, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. I mean, last time I checked, 9,300 9, employees, hmm. $25 billion market cap. Did you ever expect that could be when, uh -huh. <laughs> when you were think, starting your company? Uh, it was in the realm of possibility. I actually tend to be a little bit more of uh, many entrepreneurs, when they start, tend to think that it's, uh, the, the, they have a high likelihood of getting to your highest possible watermark. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have more of a distribution probability curve that shifts as, as you uh, either have achievements or failures. So when I started, it was like, yeah, you know, this could be one of those big, uh, you know, kind of industry giant companies, and I hope it will be, but, you know, that's kind of at the tail end of uh, when we were doing this in kind of 2003 and what the possibilities would look like. I mean, when I look at your business, when I, because I, I remember people talking about you 2004 or five, around that time, people were just saying, consumer play, what's the business model? Mm -hmm. How can you make money out of this thing, right? I mean, people were really questioning that. Now I talk to my Samsung guys, my HR department, they cannot get their work done without you. Uh -huh. So it's, it's very sticky. And uh, how did you manage that? <clears throat> well, the central thing was thinking about part of, uh, I think a lot of consumer internet investing, maybe all investing, but certainly consumer internet investing, is thinking about the way the world should be, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's, and, and you know, the, the recruiting and job seeking is one key part of the LinkedIn business model. There's, as said, it also goes to marketing and selling and a bunch of other things, which we're working towards. Uh, but the key thing when you're thinking about the recruiting was to say, well, actually, in fact, this uh, paradigm of either doing one of two things in terms of, of, of acquiring talent, which is either posting listings where you hope that uh, the right people will apply to it, you'll sort through the entire set of people there, mm -hmm. and that that will work, which is kind of a derivative of the newspaper age, or of going to uh, very kind of uh, siloed databases, kind of elite recruiting firms, et cetera, um, which is still a valuable thing, but the, the way that those two things work were very broken given the internet age because everyone should essentially have a public professional identity. That public professional identity should help with both job seeking and recruiting. It also should help with business development, and it should help with sales, and it should help with marketing, and it should help with you know, uh, professional development and, not, uh, you know, and kind of learning and development. And all of these things should be wrapped up in this one identity and that that's what it should be based on. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was the case of the way the world should be. Mm -hmm. That would then also shift the business model. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of shifting the business model, you'd say, well, actually, in fact, that's the way the activity should go. And mm -hmm. so then you have to build out uh, workflows, mm -hmm. industry disruption, et cetera, that comes from that central activity. Recently acquired a, not, not too recently, but mm -hmm. you have acquired vertical application yeah. companies like training. Uh -huh. Yep, Linda, this year. Mm -hmm. That's an example of, I guess, changing or modifying your business model a bit? Well, or is it more extending it? it it's extending. It's mm -hmm. more of a natural evolution. Because if you think about, um, I mean, roughly speaking, part of how we think about this at LinkedIn from a kind of a technical point of view is to say uh, people's professional identities and people's networks as platforms for applications. Mm -hmm. And that network as a platform is fairly central to thinking about uh, how is it we elaborate the business? Now, once you get to that, you say, well, it's everything from how are you working over an hour to how are you working over a career, and mm -hmm. there's these different time frames. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's at a, uh, an important cyclical uh, uh, engagement that is underserved by 
uh, the way things work today that plays into that career is how are you essentially uh, continually adding the right new skills, mm -hmm. given technology is changing, markets are changing, competition is changing. You need to be able to have that. Mm -hmm. Learning and development is a key part of that. So we spent two years looking at what did we think was the right thing? Should we build? Should we buy? Mm -hmm. buy build on top of buy? Mm -hmm. Uh, we realized the Linda team had a, a very high quality content production team and a very high quality content, and that was the right thing to proceed mm. from. Great. So uh, that's an interesting scale up journey. Yeah. And uh, often we talk Silicon Valley about startups, but actually, I think you have a, a story that scale up is even more critical than startups. So, can you give your version of start, stay, scale ups and how you scaled up LinkedIn yep. over the years? Well, the scale up LinkedIn over the years would take, <laughs> we'd all still be here tomorrow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Short version. Uh, yes, a very short version. <laughs> yeah. uh, so roughly speaking, uh, I'm teaching a class on this right now at Stanford uh, called Technology Enabled Blitzscaling. And the rough thing is that the secret of Silicon Valley is not just startups, it's actually scale ups. And part of the reason why if you do almost any analysis and you think about what are the uh, unicorns, multi-billion dollar companies, and how do they distribute across the globe, uh, you end up with, uh, depending on your analysis, anywhere between 50 and 70% of them in Silicon Valley. And that's pretty surprising when you consider there's roughly 7 million people here. So when you population index it, <laughs> that gets really inter interesting. When you go to most Silicon Valley folks and you ask them, you know, what is the reason that this is the case, they give you what was a, 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 it is an extremely important part and something that was very true 20 years ago, but is no longer as differentially true. They'll give you the story of startup. They'll say, well, there's technology universities, there's venture capital, uh, there's a bunch of technology companies based here, there's a culture that doesn't have the fear of failing as much, and you put that all in the mix, and you, and you, and you stir it up, lightning strikes, and you get Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the thing about that, that it certainly has been true and is still differentially true about doing startups here, the thing that, that, that uh, is false about that is now when you look around the world, you say, well, can you assemble 20 to 30 people, you know, 10 to 30 people who have technical competence? Yes, venture capital has gone global. Have many areas in the world recognized the importance of startups and of being bold and, and of not having failure? Yes. Um, and so the differential between the startup culture in Silicon Valley and everywhere else, it's still there, but it's not this anymore. It's more like this. Mm -hmm. And yet, we still produce so many of these companies. And the reason is, is because actually, in fact, we have a working network of how to do scale-ups and how to do scale-ups on a global basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that includes a talent bench. That includes how do you essentially grow a company and grow the founders. That includes a predisposition for certain kinds of business models that you can go global more fast. It's part of the reason why you know, one of the things that's commented upon here is Software Valley now versus Silicon Valley because mm -hmm. a lot of it tends to be based on how software affects industries. Mm -hmm. And so Link LinkedIn is a part of this, but it's an interesting nuance one because classically it's when do you hit the scale up uh, accelerator and how do you do that is a central part of it. And so if you look at LinkedIn for the first kind of four years, four or five years, we're actually not doing this blitz scaling. We're actually doing the tightest possible group, trying to get to a point where we can actually get uh, everything from the user acquisition to the business model all locked in in a way that we go, now is when you hit the accelerator. Mm -hmm. And that when of now is also, that decisioning is part of what Silicon Valley is pretty good at in terms of the network and how it plays. So we ran as kind of a classic, pretty thin software company, including launching our revenue products, mm -hmm. until we got, got to this point where we said, okay, now this is in place. Mm -hmm. We have the product market fit. We have uh, the fact the enterprise is ready for this. Uh, we have the fact that uh, we're grow growing glo globally and can go globally very fast. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you start moving from, you know, kind of like when you're in this early phase, basically everyone's a doer to moving from doers to managers and doers to managers to managers and executives to executives with manager and how you're building out that whole company and how you're transforming it mm -hmm. in order to have a global reach is one of the things that uh, is part of what the class is about. I'm also writing a book that probably will be published next year, but we have to finish the book first. But you know. <laughs> Very fascinating. Yeah. Obviously, the, uh, going through that scale up phase, yeah. uh, you need a different leadership. In fact, uh, some point, I think you are about 400 people, you decided to bring CEO. Yep. And uh, tell us more about this. Was it difficult to bring new person? Mm -hmm. Was it complimentary? How did you manage the process? I'm sure a lot of CEOs in this room is interested in knowing about that process. Yep. 
so I, um, I wrote an essay that's on both uh, LinkedIn and also on my, um, I, I collect the long essays on reedhoffman.org, so you can get more detail on either of those. Um, part of the, the, the old school part of the blitzscaling Silicon Valley model was founder is the product genius, innovator, risk taker, gets it going, gets the thing going, then you bring in gray hair and gray hair, scale, gray mm -hmm. hair, gray hair scales it. Mm -hmm. And that model's broken. And part of what the backdrop of that model was when you were talking about amongst a, a, bun a bunch of different VCs, and I also said, no, no, just invest in founders who can take it the whole way. That's, that old model doesn't work anymore, especially in the consumer enterprise, a little bit more murky. Um, and actually, in fact, what I, uh, part of the reason I both did my strategy the way I did and why I wrote the essay was, the mistake was thinking that you're just hiring scale management. Hiring a CEO, is hiring a, co a late stage co-founder. And when you look at what a co-founder, it's, it's somebody who uh, is deeply tied to the mission of the, of the company. Well, for example, they would basically choose to work here versus anywhere else, not because of salary, but because this is the mission they're aligned to. Mm -hmm. they, that they will adopt the moral authority mantle. Because moral authority is partially given, but also partially adopted, because it's adopted as the I am so committed to making this work that I will go and take those risks. I will take a risk by which I will go, oop, I was wrong about that because it's important for me to make this work. And so when you're hiring a CEO as a later stage co-founder you, you, or hiring a CEO to scale, you're bringing in scale characteristics, but you're also hiring them as a later stage co-founder. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so that was part of what I did. And then with the success of having done that with Jeff, uh, I also tried to help add to the tool chest of Silicon Valley by writing an essay about how to think about it mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. as people are thinking about like how do I scale a company, what is the right thing to do, because uh, it's not always the case that the founder who really brings you to a, a very necessary chunk is also the person who can scale it to 10,000 people, because mm -hmm. I actually don't like managing. I like problem solving, mm -hmm. products, business strategies, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the running an exec staff meeting is more or less a version of hell for me, right? But, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> so you knew what you liked to do, yeah. and you brought the right partner that were compatible, that had shared the same mission, yep. and built it to where, we, where it is today. Now, are you, are you spending a bit of your time at, mm. at the LinkedIn, I would imagine? Or it's about a lot half of your at Greylock time? and half at LinkedIn. Uh, okay, great. So when, you are, when you're looking at, because you, you've done, obviously, terrific investment as well, right? I mm. mean, you were involved in PayPal, um, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, these are not just small companies, right? I mean, yeah. it's just some terrific ones. So can you tell us, what are you, how do you, so some of the people in this room are also investors, mm. including our own team. Yeah. How, what, what do you look when you're looking for the area of investment? So two, two uh, categories. I always prefer the category where something is bold and different and new that I actually hadn't thought of is not part of the current zeitgeist of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and thinking through that is good. Because being contrarian and right is one of the ways that you get to most scale. So for example, when I started LinkedIn, most people thought it was idiotic, mm -hmm. right? That was actually in fact a good sign for, in terms of it being mm -hmm. contrarian right. and right. right. That, that, that is uh, actually in fact uh, the way that you, and then obviously, hopefully, in X years later, you're then an obvious essential utility part of the fabric mm -hmm. as part of it. Now, the other one is when you say, well, but like if you're executing a search pattern, what kinds of things you search for? And the short answer is uh, networks and marketplaces and platforms that can get to hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. And you look at what are fundamental activities uh, that people are engaged in, whether it's industry, individual activities, et cetera, that you say, well, if you reconfigure given the internet, where you have a notion of real identity, a network, an ability to do transactions, what are those things mm -hmm. that actually, in fact, uh, make the world substantially better? And so, mm -hmm. for example, when the, when the Airbnb founders were pitching me, um, they were one of the ones that I stopped two minutes into the pitch and said, I'm going to make you an offer to invest. Mm -hmm. Now let's just make the rest of this a working session. <laughs> right? uh -huh. Let's talk about how you're thinking mm -hmm. about your reputation system. Let's think about how you're thinking about growth. <laughs> Let's right. do all that. Mm -hmm. Because I understand how you're reconfiguring the world, and mm -hmm. the world is much better that way, mm -hmm. and this is the kind of business that can get there. All right, let's talk about a big controversial topic. Uh, <laughs> uh -oh. So, uh, but it may not be, because mm -hmm. I've also done some of similar kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's a lot of debate about this subject, and uh, I'm, I'm involved in some of the 
Bitcoin related industry companies, so do you. Yep. So let's talk about this, and obviously we must believe in something. Yep. But I want to get your perspective, how the uh, Bitcoin or blockchain can impact the uh, future of the, um, uh, the world we're living in. Yep. So uh, again, since we're going to go brief, I will refer to something I've written at Wired UK. I wrote an article about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Basic thing is there's three levels of the stack that matter. First is, is as an asset, second is a currency, and third is a platform. They're all bound together. Sometimes people mistake that they go, oh, I'm just interested in blockchain as a platform. And you're like, that doesn't work without the currency and the asset working as well. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental thing uh, that you're essentially doing here, and this is the most interesting thing about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, is that in as much as you look at, for example, ledgers like Excel as a platform, the blockchain now becomes an open platform for a variety of financial transactions that is similar to how the internet is an open platform. And that then means that you can unlock the power of, of software developers, innovators, many entrepreneurial companies, in order to get a set of applications that you wouldn't have conceived of, mm -hmm. now transforming what is possible within financial applications. Because previously, that's been locked into essentially the credit card world with some, you know, like bank transfers in Germany mm -hmm. and other kinds of things, the way of doing that. And now that is possible, and that's what's most interesting about it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, part of my thesis that I uh, argue uh, is that uh, essentially, there will be a, a crypto capital system. I called it crypto capital for mm -hmm. all three. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will either be Bitcoin or a Bitcoin derivative. Uh, now, there's an argument in favor of Bitcoin, which is they're growing market share, number of wallets, a number of assets within that at a far uh, thing that outstrips any other system. Mm -hmm. The argument in favor of something else is, well, maybe something will come along with a better design and a better feature and then supplant it. Mm -hmm. And there obviously could be more mm -hmm. than one. But you know, it's been what 500 years since mm. the uh, currency was born from Italy, I believe. Yeah. And this thing is a time for some new forms that are yes. frictionless. Yep. And for sure, and there will be a, gl a global crypto capital system mm -hmm. for sure. Right. That's uh, interesting for us all to remember as one of the messages tonight. Yeah. I mean, that's how it disrupt the world, I guess. I mean, today, if you if you are working from Philippines or Spain, and and and, and if you want to wire your money. It still costs a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. Costs like seven or eight, nine percent fees. And in today's yes. world, yes. should that be the kind of things that we should look at? But that's one of the things that you yeah. looked at. And, and for example, with Bitcoin, Bitcoin in a in a non-reversible electronic transaction is still the is is now the fastest way that you can transfer value, because a non-reversible, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah and purely electronic. I right. can hand you some gold or something, but mm -hmm. for electronic, in a non-reversible way, Bitcoin's still the fastest. Right. I mean, I love DocuSign. I, in fact, yeah. we invest in DocuSign because yep. of the convenience. But I, I think this blockchain thing could also then add a lot more value that are mm -hmm. even cheaper and better and easier and probably safer in some yeah. ways. But a lot of controversy in this. Yep. I guess we'll, we'll watch how things develop. Uh, and, and intervene, but yes. Right. Yeah. So last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so given your comments, how do you see the, the future of uh, other centers of innovation or scale-ups, like China mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. or India? I'd like to get your perspective on global geo, geo perspective, how this thing is evolved. Well, so obviously there's, uh, there's, not, there, there's a lot of great unique things to Silicon Valley or great features in Silicon Valley are not necessarily unique um, or not necessarily unique in terms of the future. So I actually think that we're, ha we're seeing global growth on innovation, on technology innovation, and also scale up, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at the, uh, the largest of the unicorns, Right, you've got to think in the last you know, 20 years, you've got to think about Alibaba, you've got to think about Tencent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? There's a number of these things that have actually also been uh, created. Um, uh, a lot of smart global investors are thinking that it's, it's India's time mm -hmm. um, and are putting money in. I, I don't know enough myself to know, but I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that from them, so I'm paying mm -hmm. more attention. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think obviously while the venture market's very heated in China, uh, you know, there's everything from the hardware, software, uh, combinations, uh, you know. I know you guys pay a lot of attention to Xiaomi and all the rest, but those kinds of things. And what what's, what's, <laughs> what what the company? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. You know what, what's going on, and, yeah. and 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 how do you? Because you know Samsung's a great competitive company. Like, how do we learn from that and 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 take our practice 
you know, learn the best things from that and then, and then beat it. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, uh, and so that kind of thing, I think, is, 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 is really interesting. And one of the things that I like about what I do as an investor mm -hmm. versus as being an entrepreneur here is that that gives me some more global perspective. Uh, global perspective. Mm -hmm. And there are interesting things. I mean, mm -hmm. like, for example, WeChat um, is actually a better sense of Messenger as a platform than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. At the moment, and so the, right. so looking at that mm -hmm. is the place yes. where I go look and say, okay, well, how how is that doing? And that actually then brings back information and in, in perspective and and uh, to what we do here. Great, Reid, I really appreciate you coming today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.